Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hello! That's right, we're right back at this. My name is Bjarke Smithmeyer. I am the FinTech correspondent at Politico, uh, but in the seven years, actually, that I've been at uh, the company, amazingly, five and a half were dedicated to macroeconomic policy making, uh, which comes in handy when you consider the shitstorm of crises which shouldn't be landing on our heads all the time. Um, but with that, uh, I have someone who can really help me get through all of this today. Uh, it's a woman who hardly needs an introduction, but I'll give one to her anyway. Ladies and gentlemen, tuning in from Brussels, I give you the Commissioner for Financial Services and Capital Markets, May Reed McGuinness. Please give her a round of applause so she can hear you all the way back in Brussels. <laughs> May Reed, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for the round of applause. It doesn't feel the same when you're not in the room. I know. I no, no. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure. But it was, it was rapturous. I can, give you, I can tell you that. Good. Well, let's see what happens at the end. Okay? We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> uh, I'm, yeah, it's a shame that you're not here. I know that you had plenty of meetings that you actually had scheduled, uh, yes. which you then had to cancel them. Among them was a meeting with uh, Bruno Le Maire, the finance minister of France. So, uh, I mean, forgive my curiosity, but what kind of things had you planned on speaking with him about? Well, look, I mean, that's between him and I, essentially, because that's our agenda. But look, we know what the topics are in front of our mind today. It's about um, the economy. It's about sanctions. It's about financial stability. Um, and I'm sure those are many of the topics we would discuss. But I will be meeting the minister um, at various meetings in the future. Uh, I, I think generally at the moment, what we're talking about is our legislative agenda. So what's to come uh, as we move towards European Parliament elections? And indeed, what are the files we need to finish uh, before uh, the, the parliamentary elections take place. Um, so lots on the agenda, and I'm sure they'll all be on um, topics that we will discuss here this afternoon. Of course, otherwise it would be very disappointing for people in the room. Um, but uh, no, I think one thing that is actually quite interesting, uh, given the fact that everyone is so focused on the crisis of confidence that banks are suffering right now, is, is we seem to forget that there is still a war on in Ukraine. Um, but the European Commission and legislators in Brussels have been very, very busy on developing sanctions against Russia to try and come up with some punitive approach for all of this. Uh, there have been 10 so far. Can we expect any more? Well, I think what my focus, because I'm uh, responsible for implementation, is that we actually implement effectively what's already on the table. And in truth, Europe has never rolled out as deep uh, um, sanctions and the significant number. We've done it with our partners globally, and we're trying to coordinate to make them effective. Equally, Equally it's, it's fair, fair to say, say that, that Europe's machinery, machinery around, around sanctions, sanctions um, was, was perhaps uh, for, for another, another time, time, so when we were, we're doing, doing less. less. We, we are, are managing, managing despite, despite the, the fact, fact that we don't have a strong mechanism in place, a centralized mechanism. We're really working hard with member states and some have huge capacity to implement. Others need support, but we're giving them all of that support. So everything we're doing at the moment is focusing, focusing sharply on implementation. And the other word we're focusing on, because it is a concern, is circumvention. The more sanctions we roll out, the more Russia will try and find ways around them. And here I think about trade. So um, items in the supply chain that may be useful to Russia when it comes to their arms industry. Uh, so we're watching very carefully, uh, you know, trade figures, customs. And we do have an envoy now, David O'Sullivan, whose role is specifically talk with third countries and to discuss this issue of circumvention. And I think when you introduce the topic of sanctions, you mentioned crisis and confidence in the same breath. I mean, frankly, Europe has faced crisis since the pandemic and indeed before that. But if you look at what we have gone through in the last few years, we've lost one member. So Brexit was a crisis. COVID was a crisis. Um, we had this illegal invasion as well. Um, and indeed, because of what Russia has done illegally in Ukraine, we've had strong solidarity with Ukraine. In all of the crisis, what really mattered from a European point of view was unity. So that we held our nerve. We knew, for example, during COVID, the beginning was very shaky and there was a lot of tension and unease. Would Europe be able to deal with this pandemic uh, which was killing our citizens right across and indeed killing people globally. And we managed to pull ourselves together. And I think we've shown that, uh, if you like, solidity and determination. Um, and I think confidence is a really important issue here. So that I, I know very well from, you know, talking to, my, my, I was going to say my electorate because that's my past, but talking to people I know very well around constituencies, they would say that 
when they saw the president of the commission acting on COVID very clearly, very strongly, they felt confident that Europe was getting its act together and would, uh, if you like, get through this. And, and we did. And I think it's very important that we understand the fragility of confidence, uh, whether it's in public health or indeed sometimes in the financial system. So all of our focus is to ensure that the resilience we, we see particularly in the financial system during difficult times is strengthened um, so that we do have the confidence of citizens to continue working with us in, in times that are very difficult. And we're not going to see any easing of those difficulties when it comes to the illegal invasion in Ukraine anytime soon. And, you know, it's worth reflecting that as we sit, as I in the comfort of my office and, and you there in Paris, that uh, people in Ukraine are losing their lives at the moment. Um, they are fleeing for their lives. Their citizens are scattered across Europe, hoping to get back, but not sure, not actually sure when that will happen. So it is a tough time. But I think that throughout the last couple of years, we've learned that perhaps crisis Crisis is the norm rather than calm. So I, I want to get into that, but I do actually want to remind the audience uh, here in Paris and at home watching um, that you can also ask questions to the commissioner. Obviously, as we go along, uh, there will be themes that obviously would be great if you stuck with those themes. Don't go completely AWOL on me. But, uh, but there would be a, an easy way for you to do this through the, the swap card platform, which you can see if you're doing this from home. But for people here in the room, there is a QR code that can get you in there. Uh, but that's how I get questions from you, so please feel free. Um, coming back to, uh, to, to the illegal invasion, uh, Commissioner, I mean, uh, like I said, there have been 10 uh, uh, 10 packages of sanctions. You're talking now about the fact that your job will be to implement these things. So, I mean, have, has it not been very effective so far? I mean, have you seen that there is a lack for implementation across the, the EU and other, member, and other countries around the world? No, we're implementing all the time our sanctions. What we're doing is addressing difficulties that individual member states might have. We're also seeing perhaps some different interpretations, and there are some court cases also impacting on sanctions. So it's our job to constantly link up with the stakeholders, whether it's the financial system or uh, manufacturers, uh, to make sure that what we have rolled out in terms of sanctions gets implemented uniformly and fully. Uh, and I have to say that we saw in the beginning, and I think you and I discussed this, that in the financial sector, in the beginning, the banks were de-risking. They were actually saying, no, we're not going to stay, even though they weren't impacted by sanctions. So I think there's a there's a, a full sense, I think, in Europe that we want to show our solidarity by literally being very true to the sanctions that are in place and making sure there isn't circumvention. But I always also would say that in wartime, uh, there are people who will try and and make profit from a sanction circumvention. Uh, and there will be the use of products um, that, you know, could find their way around the system, uh, in, in, you know, that we hadn't envisaged. So the idea of looking at trade figures, of talking to colleagues in third countries, of watching for unusual patterns, that's our job here uh, in the commission with the support of uh, the new uh, sanctions envoy. And we're doing that in a very cohesive way. I've been really impressed actually that we have managed to work really well with our member states, despite the fact, as I've said, that the architecture we have uh, perhaps it wasn't designed to meet this enormous um, 10 packages of sanctions that we have. We did not envisage, certainly in my time, uh, an illegal invasion in, in Ukraine by Russia and what that would require. We have other sanctions for other parts of the world, but none of them as deep and as comprehensive as this, and therefore requiring constant engagement, constant answering of questions. Uh, and, and to the credit of my services, who are not watching this but are at work, they have done an enormous amount of work, some of them working around the clock where that was required. But you ask the question, will there be more? Um, and and I, I wouldn't say that there will never be more sanctions because we have to match our work with what's happening on the ground. Uh, and we see things that, on the ground that are really very troubling. Uh, we don't see any sense from Russia that they realize that what they're doing is illegal, that the world does not like what they're doing, and that they should 
think again. Um, I suppose from a purely humanitarian point of view, when you realize the loss of life on both sides, the loss of children's lives, their parents, the destruction that I uh, that I see on television and the enormous costs of rebuilding Ukraine, it is such a tragedy at a time when the world is challenged by so many things, so much poverty globally, so much concern around climate change, which is adding to poverty. And yet we have to deal with this you know, horrible war uh, on European soil. So when you ask, you know, are, are there problems? Of course, there are areas of, of sanctions where we need to give more guidance and clarity and support. Um, but I think we are working well in this area and uh, ensuring that there isn't circumvention. And indeed, where we see it, we, we tackle it head on, talking to third countries. Uh, but there will always be those who will try and get around this. I mean, the other question, and I, I'll raise it rather than you um, to, to uh, get ahead, is that people say, well, is it working? Um, no, do sanctions work? And of course, sanctions are the only weapon we have uh, uh, to deal with something as horrific uh, as an illegal invasion. Um, and we don't have accurate figures of what's happening in the Russian economy. There are many people globally who are estimating the impact here, but there is no doubt if you cut a, a, a co country off almost from the financial system globally and indeed from manufacturing, from core components, it has an impact on economic activity. Russia is not going to publish figures to show us that, but we would, from our understanding and from talking to our partners globally, see that it is impacting the Russian economy. And the whole purpose of sanctions is, first of all, as a sign that what you're doing is wrong and please stop. But secondly, uh, to make sure that the, the money trail, the money flow, which allows Russia to continue to, um, to bombard uh, Ukrainian cities and citizens, uh, that that flow is, is, is slow down and, and that it stops. And equally, and I think very importantly, it's about trade. So the components that would flow into uh, the arms industry or even support industries around that, that those components are not available. And I think, and we both know that Russia relies a lot for its uh, IT, um, you know, they import a great deal, that's cut off. So they are going to see their economy going backwards because of their decision. I mean, their decision was to invade illegally. Uh, they knew there would be a reaction and now they have to deal with the consequences um, of that. Uh, one other point, which is important because okay, we- Okay, can I ask a question? I, it's very sure. good that you keep asking the questions yourself, but I feel like I should jump in a little bit. Um, but, but, but I mean, I, one thing that's probably a little bit awkward for you is that you know the EU courts have also made it a little bit difficult in implementing some sanctions against individuals. So, uh, I mean, isn't it a little bit strange to be sitting in an environment where you have the EU courts making your job a little bit harder? No, it's not awkward for me. The courts are the courts, and we have to abide by court rulings. Uh, and there's one particular case that you, you, I think you're referring to. And there are other cases happening in member states as well, and we have to keep a close eye on this because rule of law is important in Europe. Uh, so whether I find it difficult or not is irrelevant. We follow the rule of law. Uh, but but the sanctions that apply, I think, to that individual um, in that case, uh, they still apply. Some, some obviously don't because of the ruling, but others do apply. Uh, but again, Again, the truth is that we will be tested in the courts on our sanctions. Uh, we may win with some cases and we may not others. And we have to abide by what the courts uh, say and do. Um, because during this and throughout the illegal invasion, we talk very strongly about rule of law. Um, it also uh, asks us and, and, and requires us to, to ask ourselves questions all the time. So you put out a package of sanctions. Sometimes there are consequences that need to be addressed. And we've been rightly flexible and agreeable to change where we felt there were unintended consequences of sanctions. So I think we've been very open about this process and aware of legal challenges, some that are going on at the moment, and trying to coordinate what is actually happening at the member state level. Um, because it, it is, as you know, the council um, makes uh, the, the uh, sanctions and, and we obviously have to implement and, and write the text. Uh, and therefore, council as well is involved with us in terms of if change is required at any stage. Um, but when you look at what Europe has done with our colleagues from the UK and Japan and Canada, and indeed the US, it is enormous. Um, we had a gathering just the day before the first anniversary of this war. And it was very impressive that colleagues from all of those countries were in the room 
and they were in the room with industry and they were in the room with member states. And there was a strong sense that we have to work together. And we're learning from each other in this process as well. We're using intelligence that some gain and some uh, need to help us make sure that we implement fully and effectively. In terms of implementing some things, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a fintech correspondent now, so I would be amiss to ask about some of the uh, crypto controls that you've also used in these sanction packages. Um, I mean, they're specifically targeted people and companies in Russia, and I'm just wondering how the hell do you enforce that? Well, look, that's for our, our colleagues in the member states to enforce effectively where you can use crypto to try and, and circumvent. I think in the beginning, if I recall, crypto wasn't included. And then there was a realization that actually this channel could be used to circumvent our very work. Um, so efforts are being made and will continue to be made to make sure we implement all our sanctions, including the one around crypto. And there's been many other discussions about crypto because it is perceived to be a parallel I was going to say universe, but a parallel space, um, and that we we would know that some people would try and move money through crypto to avoid that their assets are frozen. Not easy, and indeed you know that, but important that we use every opportunity uh, where we can detect so that nobody does use uh, crypto to get around the freezing of their cash or their assets. Um, and, you know, from the point of view of um the, the uh, financial system, um, you know, these these are these crypto uh, currencies, uh, they are transferable securities, so they're part of this, uh, the package. So I think we have ways of, of um, you know, finding what's happening. Um, but certainly, if you have any guidance, I'm always willing to listen to an expert. What I really want to avoid is that we allow ourselves um, and, and, and maybe disappoint our citizens that what we put in place uh, is seen not to be working because people are using this other area of crypto to transfer their assets. Look what we've done around physical assets, yachts, et cetera, um, and those almost vulgar expressions of what oligarchs own. And we have to apply the same level of scrutiny to, ma to maybe things that look invisible, but are important. I actually don't own any cryptocurrencies, um, but if I had invested in 2008, I'd probably be sitting on a yacht and not talking to you today. Um, but, uh, but it's been a wild year for crypto, seeing as we're on the theme anyway. Uh, it's been a very turbulent year, uh, and that turbulent year actually sort of there's this sort of what we're calling a wet market theory where uh, the turbulence spilt into crypto friendly banks and tech sector banks. Uh, and that then brings us to Silicon Valley Bank, which also collapsed. Um, and then now we're here in terms of the, cr uh, the crisis of confidence, which has arrived at Credit Suisse. Uh, and I'm just wondering, I mean, do you buy into this idea that crypto, um, that the crisis stems from crypto? Oh, I think that's a very simplistic approach. Um, I think we understand what happened in the US, not one, but three banks. Um, we had a good debate last week in the European Parliament, and to the credit of the Parliament, they brought this uh, debate very quickly to the agenda because there's a concern about what was happening in the US. But Europe is different than the US. Um, um, it, it, those banks, if they were in Europe, would be covered by Basel requirements and standards. Um, that is not the case in the US. Um, I think we haven't heard the full story of why and the how, but clearly there was a run, which is really when crisis of confidence is displayed, it is that people lose confidence and want to get their money out quickly. It's also because the whole environment has changed. We see interest rates increasing. We have inflation. So the world, the economic world has changed from what it was uh, to something that's very different. And that brings risks into the system. If those risks are not managed, then you have problems. Um, so I think that it is maybe, as I said last week in the parliament and repeat today, that what we need to be is very vigilant and we should not be complacent because I think we are in a changing dynamic. Uh, I would say that from the banking point of view in Europe, we have implemented very strong reforms since the last financial crisis because we didn't want another. Um, our banks are strong and solid. And again, referring to the history during COVID and indeed this uh, horrible war, uh, we saw that our banks were strong, solid and in fact helped uh, governments and the economies to keep going in very, very difficult times. Um, but again, you use the words of crisis and confidence. Um, and um, my, my view here is that we have to be very concerned and careful 
uh, to maintain confidence and that where we deal with the crisis as the US is doing in its financial system, that there's a full look back as to how it happened and a look forward to avoid it for the future. That's what we did in the horrors of the financial crisis, on which I was still a member of parliament and indeed the member state I know best uh, was impacted very badly. So what you do is you don't just look at what happened, you actually fix it. Um, and you strengthen, and that's what we've done. We strengthen our financial system. And sometimes the, 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 the banks would say it's too much. I think in times of crisis or when they see what's happening, it's, it's, it's really very enlightening because then you say, actually, it may be tough, but it means that we are solid uh, and that we can deal with um, events as they unfold. There was something that you mentioned in the plenary debate which, which uh, perked my interest. Um, I mean, you mentioned the fact that in terms of other things that the EU could do to stem the contagion was also to focus on third country branches. Could you just elaborate on that? Well, that's part of the banking uh, package that's on the table at the moment, which is the, the Basel implementation. Uh, so what we need is oversight so that where there are uh, banks operating, uh, that we need to know where they're operating and, and how they're structured. I think for, 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 the, for the financial system, um, what we need to avoid is that there are parts of it which are weak uh, if we don't have an eye over them. Uh, and I think we've done very good work to date. And I uh, know from the trilogues uh, in the between Council and Parliament on the banking package, there is a real impetus to get this uh, over the line. Uh, I think that's very encouraging. It is one of the issues, the whole implementation of Basel, which caused huge concern. Um, you know, in the last two years, it's been one of the topics um, that I've had to deal with, you know, where banks and MEPs and concerned stakeholders were saying, look, uh, we're worried that uh, this uh, implementation of Basel will require too high capital requirements and banks choke off its support for the economy. Uh, and we've really come up with a very balanced package and I hope it sees yeah. its way through the process. The other point that's worth making, uh, and it certainly will be a topic for me when I visit the US, I think in the next two weeks, is to talk to their regulators and supervisors uh, to exchange views, to learn lessons from each other. Uh, because, uh, again, to the words confidence, I mean, the banking system, the whole financial system, um, you know, trust and confidence are so important. Um, they're hard to build, but they're very easy to lose. And I think that's what happened in the US, where you had one uh, bank and then you had two more following. And the US intervened uh, as it was required to do. And that's why in the case of um, our banking system, uh, I'm not at all complacent. I, I, we have a very strong uh, you know, architecture of supervision and regulation. Um, we talk to each other all the time. We're constantly reviewing and looking and in this changed environment, raising issues with the financial system to make sure that we avoid any uh, consequences and problems. And we have to learn lessons uh, from what happened in the US and see if we need to do anything more. Although my sense is that the work we've done to date and our proposals that are being worked through the system uh, are fit for purpose and will you know, strengthen even more uh, the system, which works very well today and is resilient. We shouldn't seem to forget that uh, there is a, a whole pillar in the banking union that is a shared deposit guarantee scheme, which is completely missing, that finance ministers have been completely incapable of uh, of, of agreeing in the seven years that have been a Politico, it's been quite shocking to see how that stalemate has continued. But Paolo Gentiloni did mention this morning that uh, in the second quarter, uh, you will be coming out with uh, a proposal on crisis management and deposit insurance to sort of close the loopholes. Could you be a little bit more specific? Like what's, what's coming and when? We're very happy to be more specific because it's coming in April. Um, and I think the, the what's in it, you're going to have to wait for the proposal. But it, we, what we are doing is answering the call of the Eurogroup uh, that we um, come forward with reforms to the crisis management and deposit insurance uh, framework. And we will do that. I mean, to your point, which I accept that uh, the finance ministers have found it very difficult to reach agreement on this, doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to try. And I would, you know, commend the president of the Eurogroup for, for being able to get consensus that we move at least on the CMD, the, the crisis management and deposit insurance piece. 
Uh, and I think that the proposal will be very balanced. I'm sure we will have many arguments for and against and different views. But I think that uh, when uh, people realize um, that we're very determined in the Commission, not only to put, have this proposal, but we also want banking union in its full shape uh, over time to evolve. Uh, then I think they will work, the co-legislators will work effectively. I mean, I think this recent concerns that have arisen because of the US might also focus all of our minds to, to really working very hard, as I said, to strengthen the resilience because our system is resilient, our system works, but I think this would be a really important part of it. So it's coming in April. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary McGuinness, please give her a round warm of applause and appreciation. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. I'm going to stay here. Uh, and we had actually planned to get into a couple of other the legislative agenda that uh, the Commission also has, but that's fine because I'm going to dive into them in the next panel. If my panelists could just very quickly come up and then I will introduce them. But as they all come up, please make them feel as welcome as you did. Mary Rudin McGuinness and give them a warm round of applause again. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please. Thank you. Come on up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We should have everyone, uh, so I'm looking forward to getting everyone here. It's rare that we get everyone in a room, especially when there are riots in Paris, um, but we are lucky enough to have them here. Yeah, sorry, I'm moving. Yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's very true. Sorry. Hello. George, uh, hi. Solveig. <laughs> hi, I'm hi. Solveig. Uh, who are we missing? Agat? Are we missing someone? We're missing someone, no? Oh, oh We're right. missing someone. Okay. Oh, yeah. the right. I have the impression as well, but I see only four chairs. So, ah, yeah, the, we, um, she, the, the she, ah, she's. Guys need water. Go for it. Huh? Yeah. I'm going to introduce you, and then uh, and then uh, Katarzyna is tuning in from uh, Brussels. Ah, okay. And then we can continue from there. Shall so I serve you? Yes. Then we have uh, ready to. <laughs> The mic is working. <laughs> <laughs> Seems so. <laughs> good. It's good. It's good. Well, I guess um, unless unless I'm told that uh, cameras are, are not rolling or something like that, I'll I'll just bang on. Uh, I yeah. So uh, in in fact, we don't have everyone in the room. Uh, I guess uh, no one. Well, few people from the commission uh, made the trip out to Brussels. So I'm I'm sorry that you can't join us, uh, Katazina. But I I will, I will start with you, uh, and I'll ask everyone to just sort of give a quick uh, wave at people, just so they know exactly who's who. But uh, as I mentioned, tuning in from Brussels is the European Commission's uh, policy officer on the retail financial services side, uh, Katazina. Um, I'm so sorry if I ruined your, your <laughs> name here, but uh, Kobylinska Hilliard. Yeah, was that okay? Okay, Very good. fantastic, good. Uh, then uh, sitting uh, to my right, we have Augustin Reiner, who is the European uh, Consumer Organization's Director on Legal and Economic Affairs. Uh, and next to him is MasterCard's uh, senior Vice President <laughs> nice title, yeah. uh, on Government Engagement for Europe, uh, Solvik uh, Onere Hatten. Yeah. Uh, and then at last, uh, but not least, uh, we have the Bundesbank's uh, Director for General Payments and Settlement Services, Julian uh, Reich Reichle. Yeah? Yes, yes. Is that all right? Okay. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please give me a, a, a quick round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh, as mentioned, you can ask questions. Unfortunately, the iPad shut down on me when I was talking to May Rudman Games before, which didn't make it any easier for me, but I'll keep refreshing this thing. Uh, so if you do have questions, please do send them in. Um, so this panel is very much just sort of continuing on on the payment side. Uh, I had hoped to get Mayrud McGuinness to talk a little bit more about coming legislative, uh, the coming legislative agenda on that. Payments is part of my remit uh, as a fintech correspondent because fintech and crypto have basically gotten very interested in the subject. So I've been covering this very, very closely. But the, the specific topic that we're dealing with today is, you know, where do Europe's ambitions on uh, the payment landscape, uh, wh where are they going? Um, and so I think you know uh, one of the biggest topics which are which are which people are expecting right now is is the digital euro, um, and I think what's a good way to start this debate because the digital euro is uh, quite a nerdy subject as well. I mean we're all nerds here, that's why we're here. Uh, but for people either watching on TV or people who are sitting in the audience that don't know that much about subject, uh, Julian, I'm hoping maybe you can help uh, sort of explain in simple terms what a digital euro is. The, the, 
Is the mic working? Yeah, yeah, yeah perfect. Clear. Okay, uh, the digital euro is the attempt of the euro system when it will be introduced, what is not uh, uh, sure for today, it's not decided, but if it would be uh, introduced, it would be uh, a way to stay in the game for the euro system to provide the public audience money, public money, uh, by which is similar to cash. Uh, because the only possibility to have public money in the euro area uh, for the uh, audience, for the public audience, is cash today. And what we are seeing is that cash is declining in, in the, its use. And uh, in the other side, uh, which is the counter side of the coin, is that um, uh, digital uh, payments are increasing. And so the question is what's, uh, how to deal with this situation, Beca because it is extremely important uh, for uh, not only the people, but also for the stability of the overall financial system, that uh, uh, the people do have the opportunity to use uh, something similar to cash, uh, and this could be a digital euro. And, uh, and so, why is it important? It is important because uh, at the end, uh, the possibility to change um, uh, uh, private money like your deposits on your account into official money like cash is an important cornerstone for the stability uh, of, the overall, of the overall financial system. And so it's not only a question of nice to have, but I think it's a very important question. And we'll get to that to for sure. Um, I mean, the way that I often describe it, if, if uh, I mean, it was a very, very good explanation. Uh, well done. Thank you, Julian. Uh, uh, my, my sort of very quick way of describing it otherwise, it is, it's a very virtual extension of a banknote or a coin, uh, and that we can't get into the absolute details of this, but the numbers that you see on your banking app or your banking uh, web, uh, they're, they're not real money. They, they are, they're bank commercial money. So the, the real stuff, it's, it doesn't have as much value as the bank notes that you have in your hand, and we need something like that for the online world. The ECB has been very much involved in this, uh, and uh, I'm just curious if you can just stick with Julian for a second so we can lay the groundwork very quickly. Um, you know, what is it that the ECB uh, has been doing? Like, wh what is it that it's been so busy with in the background over the past year and a half to two years? Yes, we are uh, in the in the second half of the uh, uh, of the of the phase of the project, where we uh, 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 try to find a way how to introduce something like the digital euro, and. Uh, um, uh, and uh, it's not only the ECB, to be correct, it's uh, the overall euro system, which consists also of the national central banks, like colleagues from the Bundesbank and other, other Banque de France, uh, Banca d'Italia, and, and, and so, and we try to, 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 to find solutions which are possible and which are not. And uh, this, is a, this is a phase we are within, and uh, the decision is expected to be made in the, in the autumn month, I think, and then the governing council will decide to make the next step, what does not mean that it really uh, lead to the digital euro, but which lead to the implementation phase. And, uh, and uh, uh, the, the end decision, to say in this way, uh, will be decided afterwards. Not only, I think, in, in my expectation, not only by the euro system or the governing council, but also in near collaboration with the political. Okay. Side. And so this so is you, you, you guys, the central banks, are busy yeah. like experimenting, creating Ex design features, and, and just going wild with this behind closed doors. Yes. That's the idea. So I, I guess that brings me then to uh, Katazina. Uh, you know, if, if the euro system or the central banks are so busy doing all of the hard work, then what exactly uh, is it the commission's going to propose if, if all the work's being done elsewhere? Uh, well, of course, uh, the European Commission has uh, the role of um, uh, legislative initiative. So we are there to make sure that should the decision be taken uh, to launch the digital euro, there is an appropriate legal framework available uh, to make this happen. So this is exactly what the European Commission is currently working on um, in the uh, commission work program, it has been announced that the legal framework 
for a possible future introduction, uh, introduction of the digital euro uh, is planned for the second half of, of this year. And, and, and this is what the commission is, is working on. So I guess what I'm starting to tease out here is a little bit that, and, and uh, this, this comes from going to the European Parliament and listening to uh, the ECB's uh, point person and executive board member, member Fabio Panetta, whenever he goes there and speaks about the digital euro, uh, MEPs keep then mentioning to me afterwards, what the hell are we going to legislate? Because if, the, if the, the ECB and the central banks are doing all of the hard work and the commission's basically going to spit out a piece of legal text that says, this is fine by us, I mean, like, what, are, what is it that you're leaving for the Parliament uh, and the Council to actually do? Oh, well, everything. <laughs> uh, they Enlighten are the me. Enlighten me. Tell me. They, they are, they are the legislature. I'm afraid you will have to wait for the proposal to be oh, adopted no. by the college. Uh, <laughs> I will not spill the beans here on a, on a work that is ongoing. Uh, however, you know that the Commission only proposes uh, legislation. We are not the legislators in the EU. Therefore, you know, the, actually the parliament and, and the council will have all the decisions to be made, uh, you know, so, so everything will be in their hands. Okay, everything is coming, but no one knows what. I guess that's, that's the, the end conclusion on that. Uh, but uh, Augustine, let me jump to you on this. I mean, so, so we can't get the, the meaty details uh, out of the commission. What do you <laughs> think will be the important aspects that will have to be dealt with from a consumer standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, of course, I'm representing you know, consumers' interests, you know, consumer organizations, and, of course, we are looking at how the Digital Europe, any other project in the field of payments or beyond, will affect people. So, when, if you want Digital Europe to be a success, we need to have people on our side. And for that, you need to bring them an alternative to what already exists. And, and here, where we, are, um, where we know there are a, a, a lot of concerns or doubts about, about the project, we, re we really see an opportunity to develop something that is a real alternative to cash, that is inclusive, which also means that it should be developed and guided with public interest in mind, not necessarily with commercial interest or, or, or any other um, type, of, uh, yeah, type of interest. And in that, in that regard, if we, of course, we are not going to replicate cash as, as it is. Huh? That's a reality. On the other side, we know that cash is fading away, despite the fact that uh, six in 10 transactions today are made in cash. That's not data from us, it's the, the own ECB that is saying that. Um, so the question is how we are preparing ourselves, and clearly the digital euro will, will, play, will play a role. If we think about the characteristics of the digital euro, characteristics of cash that we would like to replicate, privacy, you know, the fact that you should be able to make transactions uh, within certain limits, because of course they are important, extremely important laws that need to be respected, um, but that should be possible. Accessibility, even for example, if we talk about payment accounts, you know, basic payment accounts that is basically a right for everybody to have, it's still difficult for many people to access it, especially most vulnerable groups. Um, so having something that is really available that people can easily uh, access it, download an application, bam, already you can have it, and with that you can, you can main, main transaction within certain, uh, certain limits. And of course, it's a question of costs. Now, what are the features, the minimum features that should be available for free to everybody? And then that brings a, a, a bigger, even bigger discussion for the Commission and for the, for the central uh, bankers and the ECB. Who's going to pay for this? It's going to be paid by the taxpayers, going to be paid by uh, the consumers through their bank fees? Well, we don't know yet. And I think that it's extremely important now when we design the, the digital euro, where uh, it's uh, currently in the hands of the, of the ECB, but certainly the Commission will, will play a role, uh, a role in setting up the, the legal framework, that we need to nail down these details, because the entire success of the project will depend exactly on how we're going to design it. Salvik, I'm, I want to come to you. The digital euro uh, will become I mean, if successful, will become a, a big uh, alternative payment method. And I'm just wondering, from MasterCard's standpoint, do you see that as a massive threat to your business? Uh, so I would like to just start with actually reminding everyone that MasterCard is not only a card payment company, because usually in the mindset of everyone, we are a card payment company, but we are not anymore only a card payment company. We have invested a lot in the last years into um, any uh, forms of payments that actually um, any consumer or businesses want to be, to be paid or pay in a very secure and, and convenient manner. So we have invested a lot in multi-rail, so it's not only card payments, it's account-to-account, -account, it's instant payments, and I think that's 
key to set the scene at the, at the beginning. So when it comes to digital euro, we do actually welcome this initiative because we do believe, as you were referring to, um, uh, the strength of euro is, is key to make sure that it uh, continues to be unchallenged domestically, but also that it's, um, it, it, it continues to grow internationally. So any way to digitalize the euro, I think it's, it, it's a very important initiative that we welcome and that we do support. When it comes to what I think we should pay attention to, and it's back to what you were saying, is accessibility. If we want one new mean of payments to be put in the hands of consumers and businesses, is how they're going to adopt it, why they're going to use it. And um, easing the accessibility of such uh, a means of payments uh, will be a key success factor. One idea is to leverage, for example, existing acceptance network, like the one of MasterCard that has developed for the last decades, that is functioning very well, is super resilient. If you, you know, use those kind of um, existing networks that are uh, already operating very well, um, it will really um, accelerate the adoption of consumer and businesses in terms of uh, ac acceptance. Um, one other point I wanted to mention is that we call for, I mean, any initiative that would be launched like that for a, a, a level playing field. What I mean by that is that um, you will need to find the right uh, funding um, methods for such uh, means of payment. So um, when it comes to security uh, about, uh, and, and privacy, as you were mentioning, those are the key elements of such means of payment. I mean, we want multi-choices to be able to pay and, 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 and get paid, but what we don't want to um, exclude is security and convenience. So how the digital euro will be uh, secured, uh, that has a cost. So how it will be, uh, so those are the questions we have actually about the digital euro is it needs to be uh, fairly uh, compensated between all the providers of the supply chain that we provide this uh, high level of security. A level playing field. Um, I want to pick a little bit at the sovereignty issue, which I think you hinted at a little bit in, at the beginning. Um, Julian, I, I, one thing that uh, the ECB president, Christine Lagarde, at the Innovation Summit for the Bank uh, of International Settlements mentioned earlier this week was, you know, the digital euro will be very important for the making sure that there is a, a sense of autonomy uh, of the euro and sovereignty that comes into this. I mean, could you just explain that to me a little bit? Like, why is it that we need to be so careful on this? I think, I think uh, the so sovereignty is, is important or autonomy is, uh, is important. And why we have seen in, in, the, in the last year with, uh, with the uh, 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 Russian-Ukraine war and uh, the cyber security threat uh, we have seen, uh, uh, which increased uh, strongly in, 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 the, in the aftermath of, the, of this war. And, and so uh, we, we have to be prepared that uh, uh, we have solutions uh, which will, are working uh, in the overall euro area. And there, uh, a digital euro could be an additional alternative uh, to existing payment solutions like MasterCard or the uh, payment uh, uh, services uh, provided by the euro system uh, right now, uh, the target services, and 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 so on. And, and this is this is important. And in this sense, uh, the digital euro could uh, contribute some kind of an additional infrastructure and uh, in, enhance the security of the overall system. And so, and the autonomy is is uh, uh, really indeed an, a, a topic because uh, payments. Uh, uh, is uh, is provided uh, uh, even in the in the euro area uh, um, mostly by players outside of Europe, and uh, this do have also some kind of political dimension uh, which cannot be ignored, and 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 so it's important to have uh, 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 European alternatives, which not only have to be uh, uh, public alternatives like the digital euro or the target services, uh, but could also be private alternatives uh, uh, using uh, 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 the existing infrastructure uh, uh, like the European Payment Initiative or something like this. Yeah, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's not just Russia we're talking about, right? I mean, I think a lot of, uh, at least in my experience, when former President Trump uh, was in the White House uh, and there were threats being thrown around about being cut off from the dollar market, I seem to think that people were more 
more worried about Washington than they were about Moscow at the time. Um, but what's, what's interesting about this is that you know, the digital euro uh, is one thing. You, you mentioned the instant payments proposal, which came last year, which, for those that don't know, is basically if, if I was going to then send money to, to my friend Augustine here because he bought me a beer yesterday and I felt bad about not paying for it, then in a second I could basically send that money right over. Um, but with those two uh, proposals, there's also an industry initiative called the European Payments Initiative, which is uh, run by a bunch of banks to create an alternative payment system to the incumbents that rule the cross-border market right now, and it's only by chance we have one of those incumbents sitting right here. <laughs> so when I think about the European Payments Initiative, instant payments, and the digital euro, I'll ask you again, Solvik, are you sure you're not threatened? <laughs> <laughs> we, we hear all those initiatives. We are, I mean, we understand where they're coming from. Um, but again, I mean, as... We, we are here to offer as many choices as possible to consumers and businesses. And we believe that what is super important is that whatever the initiative is, it doesn't forget the value to the citizen and the value to the businesses that it, it brings. And we are here for a fair competitive landscape. If it's a fair competitive landscape, we're very happy to compete in that fair level <laughs> playing field. I think that's, that's the, 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 the key thing that I can say today, that um, as soon as it creates value for the, 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 the consumer that is using this means of payment, that it's super secured, and, and, and that it respects the data privacy of the, the consumer, we welcome any initiative. But let's, um, let us play in that competitive uh, and, and, and do not by um, regulation, uh, do uh, prefer one versus another. That would be my... Uh, Augustine, let's, let's bring this back down to the, the level of the people, right? I and mean, if I can add, I think we can still add some value-added services on any scheme that would be, you know, yeah. built in Europe. Because, again, the value-added services on a payment is super important. Um, this is all very high-level stuff, and we're talking about looking at you know, uh, the way that payment uh, autonomy and strategic autonomy is all happening from way up above, um, which is great that we have a consumer representative <laughs> right here next to me. Um, I mean, are we kind of overreacting here? I mean, uh, do, do you think that we're getting too fixated on, on this, uh, or is there a real threat to the consumer uh, about what payment alternatives uh, are at his or her disposal? I think that behind a, a given policy measure, there are different objectives. You know? There are geopolitical objectives, sovereignty objectives, but it also affects people if these policy measures are going to be implemented in consumer-facing markets. That's a reality. So let's take the case of instant payment, which we think is a great proposal, it's a great initiative, because what does it basically introduce for people? If you can make a transaction you know, and that transaction is for free, then you should be able to have also for free instant payment. Even checks. You know, imagine that you send me uh, money for the beer that I, I pay for you, you know, and you made a typo. You know, well, with this, actually, you can reduce all those risks. And if you see what happened in the Netherlands, which is one of the countries that introduced instant pay, um, uh, Ivan, Ivan checks, you know, the level of uh, fraud dropped dramatically. And we are seeing this constantly. How many people here have not ever received a message from your tax office saying, hey, you need to introduce your, your credentials here, or from your favorite streaming <laughs> provider saying, oh, your account is down, please put your data uh, again. And we are seeing that this is what we call social engineering. I don't know who invented the term, but voila. Um, it's, it's increasing, becomes very sophisticated, and it's very difficult for people to identify one uh, given a uh, request or payment is fraudulent or not. Yeah. So these type of initiatives are important because they're going to improve people's life in the same way that a strong customer authentication did it when we discussed yeah. PSD2 at the time. But should people also, for instance, be you know, nervous about the fact that you know, uh, the Europe, Europe's cross-border market is dominated by uh, uh, two, two big uh, payment services, or for instance, that yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I, I mean, I, I have an iPhone in my hand, which is not made by, you know, a European company, for instance. I mean, is that something that the average person should be afraid about? 
Uh, whether they should be afraid, I would not say. Or concerned. Cons concerned? Yes, I think everybody should be uh, concerned when there is not enough competition in a, in a market because ultimately it's going to affect the quality of the service that we will receive, the prices that you're going to pay for. Of course, they should be, they should be concerned. But when people are concerned or should express their concerns, when they go and vote and they decide who is going to, to be there, and if you have someone they know that is pushing for a pro-competitive, a pro-competition, a pro-consumer agenda, well, then you know that your concerns are being to be channeled. But we cannot pretend that the people on the street, you know, with all the problems that they're facing through there, they're going to be worried, oof, there is only MasterCard and Visa. You know, what are we going to do about it? Oh, this is terrible. You know, well, I think that people have other worries, and it's for the politicians and decision makers to provide the right conditions to have competition to, to emerge and to be protected. Quickly, sorry, yeah. I'm going to Yeah, bring very in quickly, Katsu, because you know. I, I, I think this old idea about a, mono, a dual <laughs> monopoly between Visa and MasterCard in Europe is over. I think it has been in our mind for years and years, but the reality is different. The reality is that in the last five years, maybe lots of new players have come up in the European system, in the European uh, geographies. Cross border, I'm though? No, I was talking about uh, uh, within Europe. But, but you rule the cross border market. But again, I think the AP and the digital euro is about uh, European geographies. Right, and but the digital euro might not even happen. That's what they keep saying <laughs> to us. And the EPI has had its own problems. So, so I wanted to, yeah, just to comment that actually in Europe, there's no one single payment scheme that owns more than 30% because you have Bizum, you have Blick, you have uh, Carbank in terms of a local scheme, you have many initiatives. So I would like just to kill this idea that has been in for years that there's only Visa and Mascara. That's not true. There's much more than that. <laughs> I, I think we could have a whole other debate on that one <laughs> as well. But yeah, fair enough. Uh, no, so I, I, I haven't forgotten you, uh, Katazina, back in Brussels. Uh, <laughs> we, we all miss you terribly over here in Paris. Um, I mean, these are not the only payment initiatives which are coming out of the Commission. There's going to be a review of the Payment Services Directive, uh, which has already been revised once, uh, so it's PSD2, and then something called Open Finance. Can you? give us a sense of what's in there, but hopefully a little bit more detail than you gave on the digital euro. Sure, um, <clears throat> I can do that. If you also allow me just to make a, a very small comment yeah. on, the, um, uh, on, on the discussion that you just had. Uh, I would absolutely agree that, yes, uh, there's, uh, of course, a lot of solutions available, but unfortunately, they all work only on a domestic market. And you were asking if it should be a concern for the consumer. Uh, well, I mean, it is a concern for many consumers, and believe me, we hear that all the time, uh, that they do not have a single market experience. They go abroad, they have a family abroad within the EU, which is supposed to be a single market, and they feel the difference. Uh, they can no longer pay with the payment method that they use domestically. So this, of course, from the single market perspective is a big, big obstacle. And the other um, thing I, I think that should be mentioned that wasn't covered in this discussion is the perspective also of the retailers, um, where you know they, they do feel quite um, squeezed currently with oftentimes very limited options, again, because of uh, very limited options for cross-border payments in shops. So uh, I think you know, uh, more choice of innovative, secure, affordable, pan-European cross-border working and inclusive payment solutions is something that we want to do with all these initiatives. Um, and now to uh, uh, answer your question, of course, in addition to the ongoing negotiations which we have on the instant payment proposal, uh, we are working currently on the uh, review of the uh, PSD and I should say also a, a revision. <laughs> Uh, so the review will, will uh, according to our plans, at least lead to a revision of this uh, Bible of payments, if I may say so. Um, and here, um, I would rather say it's uh, we plan an evolution rather than a revolution. Uh, PSD uh, 2 has been working, uh, you know, quite well. It has introduced uh, the uh, the concept of the open banking and the very important uh, security feature of strong customer authentication. But now it's a little bit time of, uh, you know, lessons learned and trying to assess um, how it can be improved, whether it needs to be improved, whether there's any uh, uh, missing elements uh, that need uh, tweaking. And, and here, again, with, with a very strong caveat that, of course, nothing is decided until it's decided by, by the College of the Commissioners and uh, the planned timeline for this initiative is uh, at the end of June. 
uh, <clears throat> but um, here I can say perhaps a little bit more about what we are considering. Um, it is to uh, look into the, uh, the, the, the consumer protection fraud prevention uh, measures and see how we can improve that. So look at the potential strengthening of uh, the strong customer authentication, making it more workable in some situations. Um, then uh, we're also looking at other uh, security features. We, um, Augustine mentioned the IBAN name check, uh, you know, which is proposed for instant payment, but perhaps it might make sense to uh, extend it to uh, all types of uh, credit transfers. Um, we're looking into the liability uh, related to uh, fraud of the PSPs, whether it remains adequate, also given the new types of, uh, of fraud that is uh, that is affecting payments, which did not necessarily exist at the time the PSD2 was adopted. Um, um, then, uh, of course, one of the very important elements that the PSD2 introduced was open banking. Uh, it, is, it is working well, and it introduced this more variety of uh, players on the payments market. Um, but we are looking into, uh, you know, how we could make it uh, work even better. Uh, there were, of course, you know, expectations both from the third party providers and from banks to make sure that um, everybody, uh, you know, has skin in the game. Um, so uh, we are also looking at, at open banking from the perspective of the users and the potential introduction of uh, giving them a little bit more control of, of uh, an, an overview of the uh, consents that they offer. Um, we're looking into uh, the issue of enforcement uh, to see how we can uh, make it a little bit more harmonized. Of course, PSD is, is a directive, which means that the member states have some uh, room for maneuver in terms of the uh, implementation. And uh, sometimes it's, it, it works and makes perfect sense. And, and sometimes uh, perhaps more harmonization may be, uh, may be useful. And um, finally, we are also looking into um, how we can improve the level playing field uh, <clears throat> in terms of the uh, non-bank uh, participants of the market and their access to payment system, whether it's uh, indirect access or uh, or, or participation in the uh, in the payment systems, which currently is uh, due to very simply historical reasons reserved only to credit institutions and not other types of payment service providers. Um, so I hope this was uh, this compensates. Uh, yeah, it did. It was good. Yeah, you, you got, 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 <laughs> I got some. I, I didn't actually interrupt you because I was thinking, oh, she's going. I'm going to let her keep <laughs> going. So yeah. But one of the things that's interesting about the open finance side is basically making sure the fintechs can gain more access to data from all types of uh, financial players. So insurers, uh, uh, asset managers, pension providers, not just banks. Um, but uh, I mean, we don't have a lot of time. But I did want to get into that particular. The, you know, what are the pitfalls? that come from opening up uh, data, uh, uh, Augustine, if I can ask you that. Of course. Um, so in this type of market, financial markets, extremely complex market for the average, the average consumer, um, the more data you provide or the more data is collected, the more they know about you, the more they know about your needs, the more they can target you, and the more can also identify, for example, if you talk about insurance, your risk profile. So the question is, um, by allowing the offer to know much more about the demand, you know, what can go wrong? Personalized pricing, you know, individualized targeted uh, practices, the risk of exclusion. What happens if you present a risk profile that is much higher than what I could have known without having your, your data, and I say, no, look, I don't insure you, or I charge you even more. So, of course, we need to be careful when we talk about open finance. I think it's also, um, we need to talk about a product-specific basis. Huh? Um, it's very, very easy to talk very broadly about uh, what can happen with the data, all the opportunity for innovation, so on and so forth. But we need to look at each individual user case and what would it mean for the consumer having more personal data uh, for the provision of specific services. Huh? Uh, I'm, I'm going to finish with you in a second, Sylvie, but before I do, then, Julian, I, I mean, are these, the, these sort of data movements, I mean, is that something that concerns you guys at the Bundesbank, for instance, or is that you don't really want to get your hands dirty on that? 
No, I think uh, it, it concerns us in this way as uh, that is an important feature or privacy has to be an important feature uh, for all payment systems, uh, but especially for the digital euro. Uh, we, we had a consultation with regard to the digital euro and privacy was on top of the issues uh, labeled by the, by the participants. And so uh, every solution for a digital euro has to accept uh, or respect privacy. And this is very important, and this could also have some implications with regard to the techniques behind the digital euro. And so it's an important feature, and uh, it, 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 I would not call it a concern, but I think it's an important aspect we have to, to remind. Yes. And so, Sylvie, if you forgive a cheeky question, opening up the data vaults uh, of people's privacy, is, is that something that you tell people they should be a little bit careful about, or are you... You know, is this an opportunity? No, actually, we are su I'm super al aligned with my uh, two uh, colleagues, uh, <laughs> European colleagues, uh, because, um, I mean, for anything that we're doing, I mean, data privacy is at the center of everything. What I mean by that is that, actually, we should be proud of being European in that, in that sense, because, uh, and I am French, I'm deeply European. Um, with a Norwegian name. With a, yeah, indeed. Because we are championing the regulation in terms of that privacy. Just to give you, I mean, the examples that we all know around the table about GDPR, at MasterCard, it all came from Europe. We, we get, got compliant to that and we exported it globally into our cooperation, into the other, other regions. And it always comes from Europe. So I, I think we should be very proud about what we're doing. And I think data privacy is absolutely, I agree with that, and should be uh, top of mind of uh, everything that the EU is doing around digital euro, but also around open finance. So we are actually welcoming very much, and, and I think that's really the role of the regulation. I think we need to find the right balance be between what the regulation and the regulators are doing in terms of op open finance, open banking. I think their role is really to protect consumers, to protect businesses, and that is data privacy. What they, I think, need to leave to um, the market providers are defining the technical standards about any solutions and, and, and competing, again, in a fair uh, level, uh, level pl playing field uh, with our product and services. But everything related to consumer protection, data privacy, I think it's, it's super important and I'm very happy that uh, the EU Commission is leading that way. Privacy is king. Ladies and gentlemen, please give my <laughs> guests a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. As my panelists walk off, uh, I'm now going to relieve you for just 20 minutes, go out, have a chat, have a little drink, uh, and then I will welcome you back, uh, in, as I said, in about 20 minutes. But until then, I'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you, Brock. Thank you. Thanks for being here.